Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you for everyone who showed up and who's here in person. I know that there's a number of folks that joined us online um, virtually, so I'm looking forward to having a conversation after I share the remarks that I have. Um, but I appreciate that that uh, that very nice and well curated introduction and video kind of presentation. I don't think I've ever had that before <laughs> before I came up to share some of my academic work. Um, but I really appreciate that enthusiasm and the spirit of the introduction. Also appreciate Brother um, Rashid for inviting me to be here with you all to commemorate um, in a meaningful way Black History Month. Hopefully, something that I share in this um, space span of this presentation will plant a seed. Um, for some way that you might kind of go out and share more about the work um, and the legacy of Black History Month, which is really tied to the story about Black educational history that I will be sharing with you all today. Um, and I should say that the, the, the presentation that I'm gonna be sharing um, is somewhat of a kind of a blending of a number of my projects that I've done over the span of the past few years, um, but also a reflection on my approach to studying um, the history of African American education in a way that has been trying to write against so much that has shaped how we think about the history of Black education, right? Um, and to offer a more um, expansive vision about how Black folks have pursued education for the purposes of freedom and liberation um, and what that has looked like and what it has felt like as well. And so writing from Black people's perspectives about that set of experiences. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about how I got to that work because um, it was a challenge just using uh, you know, typical kind of historical methods to try to uncover some of this work because of a racial past that stifled um, and kind of blocked the preservation of a lot of the important material that I, that I had hoped to mine and bring into the, into the work that I'm doing. And so this talk that's entitled Black Reconstructions is about my work as a historian um, reconstructing these narratives about African American teachers and students. Um, and I'm situated at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, but my training as a historian comes from the field of African American studies. And so I'm really thinking about these questions at that intersection. Um, and one thing that's become increasingly, uh, you know, uh, top of mind for me is that there is a, a peculiar silence in education research. I mean, it's one that has great implications for both theory and practice. And that is that the field of education has given very little attention to the problem of the archive, right? So archives are collections of physical sources that are systematically preserved and organized for studying the educational past, right? Historians work out of archives, we go, we study old documents um, and things that we can use to reconstruct our memories and, and, and our understandings of, of, the, of things that happen that shape the present moment, right? And my sensitivity to silences in the historical record extend from my training in African-American studies, an interdisciplinary field that seeks to describe dynamics of black life and culture with more nuance, clarity, and beauty. Scholars of African American studies pursue more freedom and justice for all of humanity, especially those most vulnerable in our society. Black studies and education studies are similar in that they are both problem oriented interdisciplinary fields. And while they both maintain a shared commitment to social transformation, Black studies begins from a place of recognizing racial domination as foundational to the social world and a force that must be accounted for in any pursuit of justice and collective flourishing. So here's some questions that kind of animate my work, right? How might a Black Studies orientation to the archive invite more expansive visions of African American educational history? And what implications might revisions to African-American educational history have for the national story of schooling in the United States? Right, so these are the questions that really frame the, the work that I'm gonna be talking about today. And my goal of producing more descriptive and illuminating narratives about black school life has required methodological approaches that accounts for these archival silences that I've been talking about. 
And this awareness informs my reconstructions of the educational past and my interests and in how that past relates to our present. Recognizing that there is much to be learned from the material sources left behind by African-American teachers, students, and communities, I strive to imagine how the archive might be reconstituted to enable new ways of knowing, new ways of seeing. And my very first trip to conduct archival research about education actually presented an unexpected opportunity to reflect on these questions. So I was a graduate student and it was in July of 2013 that I encountered the autobiography of Sandy Rufus Youngblood. In this 15 page autobiographical sketch, Youngblood discussed his family's history of enslavement, his coming of age during the period of reconstruction and ultimately his journey to becoming a lifelong educator, having taught in South Carolina, Georgia and Oklahoma as a public school teacher principal and then later college professor. This intimate story of black enslavement and educational striving was handwritten in the back of an old estate ledger. A clerical instrument developed to increase the efficiency of record keeping during the slave trade. Youngblood's parents would have been taken into account as quantities in ledgers of the plantation and the slave ship. And after slavery was abolished, wealthy white landlords and shop owners continued to use the ledger as a tool of anti-black domination. A record book for marking up debts owed by black farmers and sharecroppers, many of whom were illiterate and unable to contest such economic exploitation. Sandy Youngblood's decision to write his life over the grid of the ledger challenged past and present Black subjection. His literacy, his life, and self-narration all belonged to an educational heritage that critiqued the social order and the use of the ledger as anti-Black technology. I found this ledger in a box labeled oversized items in the Sandy Rufus Youngblood collection at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. This very small yet rare collection on black pedagogy was at the time unprocessed. A fact that remains dis uh, that reveals distinctive challenges plaguing black collections from the post Civil War era. And when I say unprocessed, it meant that this was a collection that Emory had in its library, but um, but that but that wasn't widely available available for research because it was unprocessed right there was no kind of full cataloging of the materials and things like that. So even when African Americans produced an extensive record the history of racialized exclusion within the academy black economic precarity and other forms of structural neglect have led to the loss and inaccessibility of archives about black life and culture. And such dynamics in the archive exemplify what one of my colleagues, Sarah Lewis, calls negative assembly. And this has to do with the excision and exclusion of details, ideas, and historical materials that block scrutiny or skepticism about the foundations of white racial supremacy and the racial order it secured. So thinking alongside Sarah Lewis, I assert that African Americans in Reconstruction and after had more access to literacy, more opportunities to narrate the self or to plead their own cause. But the loss and erasure of historical materials did not cease. One cannot assume archival abundance in the afterlife of slavery. And historians of transatlantic slavery have been very instructive to my thinking here. Right, these are historians of, 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 of the transatlantic slave trade who have been forced to rely on records left behind by slave traders to produce new stories about the enslaved people. Black people appear in these historical sources mainly as commodities. They appear as numbers, captive bodies, fungible beings denied individuality. But there are scholars 
in the field, such as Vincent Brown, Saidia Hartman, Jennifer Morgan, just to name a few, who have led the way in contemplating the challenges and the possibilities of reconstructing Black life worlds, given such violent limitations structuring the archive that remains. And slavery's archive is problematic, not only because the identities of the captives were violently erased in the documents, right? But also because of the aggressive neglect of sources that privileged the perspectives and the interior lives of the persecuted, right? So it's not only about um, the fact that black folks are not reflected in most of the records that do exist from these ship logs and things from the period of slavery, but also the fact that there has been, there has historically been very little attention paid to preserving materials that actually do feature the voices of black folks during these historical eras in the past, um, not just in slavery, but also so the 19th and 20th century, which much of my work is situated in. So having recognized its limitations, there are some scholars who turned away from archives, right? They turned toward theoretical and methodological questions about how to read what is not there. Others have worked to develop strategies for interpreting the archive more inventively. Saidia Hartman, for instance, who's a literary scholar and a very important scholar in Black studies, she has explored what is possible through a full exploitation of what we call the subjunctive, right? The what if, the could have, the what might have been. And some move beyond the archive completely, choosing to pursue more than just material remnants of the past for historical reflection. The embodied, the performative, the literary imaginations, right? Thinking about how we might look to novels and literature written by black folks to access things from the past that may not have been preserved in traditional historical sources. But increasingly, what I'm trying to stress is that fewer people turned back to the archive for more gathering and more mining. A key part of my historical method, however, has been the work of archival assembly. The discovery, preservation, and at times rearranging of historical collections to address erasure and archival silences. And it's these three commitments of discovery, preservation, and rearranging archival collections that to address gaps in the historical record that inform the various research projects I'll now turn to. And the, remain, the remainder part of my talk is gonna be broken up broadly into two sections, each featuring um, one of my historical monographs. I will also mention in the process three additional projects, right? A digital archive I am building funded by a major grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, but also two literary classics on black education, which I've recently edited and introduced. And I welcome the opportunity to speak more about these latter projects during the Q&A um, because I won't have very much time to talk about them in, in the presentation that I've prepared for today. But all of these things fit together and are responding to these questions that I'm raising about silences in the archive and what it means to reconstruct the history of black education to shape both how we remember it, but also, but also for extracting resources for responding to contemporary issues around race and power and education, right? We might think about the Florida case around AP African American studies, the various uh, you know, efforts to pass anti-CRT bills, all of these things I would suggest are deeply related to this history that I'm talking about and that I'll um, continue speaking about. So part one, assembling a fugitive archive on black teaching. So my desire for a new interpretation of black educational history actually began with the textbook. I came across a passing reference to Carter G. Woodson's textbooks, one of which you see pictured on the screen here being read by a group of junior high students in New Orleans during the 1930s. Um, I was familiar with Woodson. I knew that he was um, the famed historian, the child and the student of formerly enslaved people, and that he was the second black person to receive a PhD from Harvard in 1912 after W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and I was also familiar with his most iconic book, The Miseducation of the Negro, which I'm pleased to say I've recently edited for a that was just published um, last week with Penguin Classics. And I think it's important to emphasize that this is the very first time that this work 
has been published by a mainstream press. Um, and this is its 90th anniversary. Um, but I wrote a new introduction, annotations, and put together a set of an appendix of archival materials that help situate this classic text for contemporary readers. But while I was familiar with all of these aspects of Carter G. Woodson's intellectual contributions, the story of him writing textbooks from 1922 until 1950 and their wide circulation among black teachers posed a narrative problem for me because it challenged an impoverished framing of African-American education based on institutional and ideological histories documenting separate and unequal schooling before Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, right? So if many of us are familiar with Brown v. Board in 1954 that ruled that separate schools were inherently unequal um, and you know that was a really important uh, groundbreaking uh, Supreme Court decision that took a major chip at and helped chip away at Jim Crow, right? But the narratives that we have about black education before this time period that paved the road to Brown was supposedly one where black schools were had dilapidated school buildings, unequal funding, and all of these sorts of things, right? And it's not to say that those things are not true, but what I'm saying is that that narrative, this impoverished narrative of separate and unequal only captures part of the story of black education. They failed to remember the art of black teaching, which I wrote about in Fugitive Pedagogy, a legacy represented by those very textbooks published by Carter G. Woodson. And while I was impressed with Woodson's contributions, I became mostly concerned with the tradition of teaching that he represented. And it was the story of one educator in particular that forced me to confront the broader social history of black teaching that made Woodson's intellectual idea so impactful. And her story is largely undetectable in traditional educational records, instead existing in otherwise places, requiring the work of archival assembly. Tessie McGee read to her class in a steady, measured tone, quietly engaging in a calculated act of subversion. She was black, 28 years old, and she taught history in 1933 at the only black secondary school in Webster Parish, Louisiana. The all white Department of Education and local school board gave very clear instructions. Teachers were to keep the pre-approved outline openly displayed on their desks, which they were to follow closely to acquaint their students with the targeted learning objectives. Black educators and families in Webster Parish had little formal control over curriculum Yet on many occasions, Ms. McGee made what she deemed to be necessary revisions to the mandatory curriculum. Based on her own judgment, and perhaps at the recommendation of fellow black teachers, she often read passages from Carter G. Woodson's book on the Negro, which rested comfortably in her lap. She kept the textbook out of sight, understanding that if she were to be caught, she would be vulnerable to the disciplinary practices of Jim Crow authorities. But she was undeterred. One of Miss McGee's students from that year recounted, quote, she read to us from that book. When the principal would come in, she would simply lift her eyes to the outline that resided on the desk and she began teaching us from the outline. When the principal disappeared, her eyes went back to the book in her lap, end quote. Tessie McGee's method of instruction constitutes a textbook example of what I came to call fugitive pedagogy. Fugitive pedagogy consists of African Americans' physical and intellectual acts that explicitly challenged anti-Black protocols of educational domination. And these were actions that often took place in discreet or partially concealed fashion. And I should say that my use of this term fugitive draws inspiration from literary scholars Stephen Best and Saidiya Hartman's discussion of what they call fugitive justice, where they introduced the idea of two competing narratives of the fugitive's identity. Fugitive connotes the dual image of one who escapes enslavement 
or jailed confinement, which justifies technically his capture, even death at the hands of law enforcement. However, they write, the violence of enslavement and legal capture engenders as well the countervailing narrative of and by the fugitive as a victim of anti-Black domination, where Black people developed new standards of justice, new ways of knowing. And we find parallel, equally competing historical images when adapting this concept of Black fugitive life to American education. And it is reflected in the extensive factual counter narratives found in Carter G. Woodson's textbooks, right? The very textbook secretly taken up and put into practice by Tessie McGee. Fugitive pedagogy also draws inspiration from the historical archetype of the fugitive slave who emerged as a folk hero in the curricular imaginations of black teachers. As early as 1890, because we, we, can, we find black school teachers writing textbooks back to the 1800s, right? As early as 1890s from the textbooks that I studied, we find African-American teachers writing textbooks filled with heroic narratives about enslaved blacks who absconded from plantations, those who led slave revolts, stories about maroon communities in the dismal swamps of Virginia, Suriname, Brazil, and Jamaica. And it was also clarifying to learn that the very first black author textbooks were actually written by fugitive slaves. James W.C. Pennington, an escaped slave from Maryland, who became a teacher in Connecticut, I should say, um, inaugurated this tradition in 1841. A textbook on the origins and history of the colored people represents the beginning of a formalized practice of black people striving to rewrite the system of knowledge. The fugitive slave William Wells Brown also wrote a textbook in 1863. So as the 19th century witnessed the proliferation of newspapers, journals, and various other forms of black print culture, textbooks became tools, not only of the masters, but also of the fugitive slave. So my conceptualization of what I've been stating as fugitive pedagogy is essentially naming a phenomenon that surfaced in the archive at multiple levels, right? I'm offering this language as more than just some elaborate metaphor, but it's saying that there's, it's, draw, it's drawing a narrative line from enslaved people's defiance of anti-literacy laws that criminalized black education, right? The earliest anti-literacy law in the US was established in 1740, right? So before U US independence, Right, this, these, these were laws that criminalized black education and they proliferated in the southern states. But what I'm saying is that through this language of fugitive pedagogy is drawing a line about the political history between those enslaved people stealing away at night, learning to read and write in pits in the ground to the actions of teachers like Tessie McGee, who continued to engage in these kind of subversive practices because black education continued to be met by violent white resistance. And so one of the other things that I want to emphasize here is that fugitive pedagogy was a collective endeavor, even when manifesting as individual acts of practice. For example, that principal entering Ms. McGee's classroom was a black man named J.L. Jones. And records suggest that Principal Jones supported the inclusion of black history and culture at Webster Parish. And we know this because he was a leading member in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, which had explicitly endorsed Carter G. Woodson and his work by the 1930s when this event took place. This is one, this is uh, a, a short write up talking about the Webster Parish Training School. You can't make out the, the text from where you're sitting, but this, these are some of the journals from black teachers that I recovered from their professional organizations. Uh, and we know that Woodson also appeared regularly in states like Louisiana at these colored teacher association meetings and at various uh, black teacher group meetings across the country. This is Woodson's life membership card in the National Association of Teachers and Colored Schools to the far right. And this is one of many newspaper clippings where we see Woodson appearing at these uh, state and national black teacher organization meetings. This is one from Tennessee, but we find these sorts of newspaper excerpts in black newspapers all over the, all over the place. So what I'm saying, though, is that given this context, it is not implausible to consider that Principal Jones and Miss McGee 
may have very likely conspired together. The principal testing the teacher to ensure that she could protect herself and the school if a white official entered the room. Because black educators walked a tightrope when challenging such oppressive schooling contexts. If they were to fall or be caught, there was no safety net to catch them. And I want to share a little bit about what I mean here about why these teachers are having to walk this tightrope. Just a few years prior, the white school board in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which was heavily influenced by the Ku Klux Klan, I should say, they learned that Carter G. Woodson's textbooks were being used in the local black high school. The books were confiscated, the teachers were reprimanded, and the principal was threatened with his life and forced to resign. And examples of this kind of violent oversight are plentiful. Black teachers were routinely targeted and fired for challenging white authority. Some notable examples of this being Ida B. Wells, who was fired as a teacher in Memphis, Tennessee in the 1890s after writing um, publicly about a number of uh, different ways that local white school officials were exploiting black women teachers in various ways, sexually and otherwise, in the context of Memphis schools, but also uh, John W. Davison, who was fired in the early 20th century from a school that he founded in Georgia, Anna Julia Cooper, who was demoted as the principal of the first black public high school in the country, which was the M Street School in Washington, D.C., um, and an, the iconic case of Septima Clark, who was fired because of her political activism in South Carolina. And it's important to note that some teachers lost more than their jobs. Harry and Harriet Moore were fired in 1946 and later killed when their home was bombed in Mims, Florida on the same date as their wedding anniversary. Black teachers' awareness of such stories prompted them at times to conceal their pedagogical objectives and the presence of intrusive white power, even as they develop strategies to contest this violent reality. For instance, teachers like McGee were connected through what the sociologist Alden Morris has called insurgent intellectual networks. And these were institutions like Carter G. Woodson's Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which he founded in 1915 as a school teacher, right? And it's through this organization that he founded what we know today as Black History Month, but he founded it as Negro History Week in 1926 through that organization, but also colored teacher associations, right? These are these organizations and groups that comprise this insurgent intellectual community. Such organizations comprised a veiled yet networked Black educational world. And it's through these institutions that teachers engaged with intellectual resources by black scholars, and they used these spaces to organize against forces of domination that infringed on their dignity as educators. Right, and so after learning that Tessie McGee's principal was a leader in the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, I decided to seek out the records of these organizations across the country to assess Carter G. Woodson's influence among black school teachers. Um, and I should say that I had to do this because after presenting some of this work early on when I was a graduate student and early on as a junior faculty member, I would go to the, you know, the American Organization of Historians or OAH and all of these different history conferences and I would be met with, with suspicion about how could I be sure that Tessie McGee was not just one extraordinary teacher? How could I be sh so sure that um, she wasn't an exception to the rule, right? Um, and so I started to kind of seek out these records to try to see if I can identify and trace Woodson's influence. But locating these materials proved more challenging than I expected. And this is, you can't read on the document on the screen, but this is also from the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association. And this is from 1935. And what it has is it lists a number of teachers in the state of Louisiana who are leading these study groups by grade levels working to figure out how they might infuse their curriculum with scholarship around black life and culture, right? Because it was not formally included in the Louisiana curriculum. Um, but what I found after traveling to more than a dozen states and Washington DC was deeply concerning. Some records were cataloged and easy to access, but the majority were unprocessed, similar to that story about Sandy Rufus Youngblood that I shared in the beginning. 
The majority were unprocessed or existed in bits and pieces scattered across multiple historical repositories and personal collections. Sometimes I was told the materials did not exist. Sometimes I was told the materials did not exist. Um, after, after traveling to, um, you know, from New Orleans to Jackson, Mississippi on a hunch, only for a near complete collection to later be discovered in a plastic bin rotting away in a closet. Sometimes the journals of colored teachers associations sat on shelves in libraries as ordinary reference material, despite their fragility and historical significance. Recognizing the disorderly nature of this archive, I decided that my work as a scholar included the custodial task of securing the long-term preservation of these collections to insist that an archive remains for subsequent generations of scholars who will exceed my work and indeed my lifetime. So since 2018, I've been building the Black Teacher Archive, which entails locating, collecting, and digitizing the serial journals and publications of colored teachers associations. This digital archive will launch in September 2023, and it is an open access online portal. The BTA will be the largest repository of material on African American teachers and education. And while this has great implications for the fields of education and African American history, the BTA is also significantly transforming the ecosystem of historical collections at Harvard. Right, so Harvard University, a place that loves to tout how much um, historical materials are, are available there and the importance of historical research, right, we can see how the, um, the important kind of documents and historical materials around Black education have been underappreciated. Harvard Collections has more than 6 million digitized objects and of this number and of this number less than 440 digital text files have any relevance to African American education, teachers and students. Harvard has 29 digital uh, curated digital collections and only one of these 29 collections has anything related to African American history. And I should say that this uh, collection that I'm referring to is about slavery and abolition. The, ma the majority of the historical material in that collection are documents by white anti-slavery advocates. On the other hand, the Black Teacher Archive will be comprised of more than 50,000 pages of text written by African-American school teachers up and through the Jim Crow era. And there are almost 70 years that will be represented by these journals, right? So the earliest um, journal that we were able to discover and include in this collection was from 1907 and the latest in 1973, right? So these organizations existed in the 1800s, but they were forced to integrate themselves out of existence um, during the 1960s with the rolling out of desegregation. That history about these institutions is a very important part of the story of Black education that we're only recently starting to fully appreciate about what was lost with that in those institutions that were forced to dismantle themselves. Um, so this is essentially increasing Harvard's collection by 450%, but also these journals are going to be able to transform the way that we're able to study the history of black education, right? By virtue of them being digitized, we'll be able to do something like search the name of someone like Mary McLeod Bethune or Carter G. Woodson across what will eventually be more than 2,000 journals um, or 50,000 pages of writing by Black teachers up and through the 19th century. And it'll show us how many times Carter G. Woodson is referenced or how many times Negro History Week is referenced. And we'll be able to then go to each of those individual journals across states to kind of bring these things together um, and to sharpen our analysis and to recreate new stories about the history of Black education that up until this point we haven't been able to do. So effectively, we're creating through the Black Teacher Archive, um, an archive that does not exist in physical, that does not and cannot exist in physical form, essentially. And so I wanna kind of move to close out this section by talking about the fact that, you know, it was a, a, it was a meek unexpectedly coming across the story of Tessie McGee that led to my assembling of a fugitive archive. 
right? One of her students documenting what he recalled his teacher doing in the classroom that then led to me studying more about the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association and so on. Um, and what was important is that it helped me understand that the history of black education is not only a story of separate and unequal, right? But that black education has always been more than just the structural neglect and the kind of lack of resources that they've been denied. It's been more than just narratives about black suffering. I um, mean, that we have to look carefully in order to understand how black folks navigated power in the context of schools. Um, because as the poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar put it, right, black teachers have always learned to wear the mask, right, in the presence of power, given their familiarity with the way power and anti-blackness worked and structured the world that they had to navigate. These were lessons that I learned not in a graduate school seminar, right, not while studying collections at the Library of Congress or uh, at the libraries at historically black colleges and universities, but these were lessons that I found stored away in a personal collection, a student, a, a student recollection that was tucked away in a crawl space at a black Baptist church in Maryland, right? That's where I located this material about Tessie McGee's story, right, not in these formal archives, that I was traditionally trained I had to rely on in order to write these kinds of histories. And so now I want to close by just saying a little bit about what my new book is about um, and, the, and the role of student voice in my historical reconstructions of the past. So my new book, School Clothes, um, is a work of creative nonfiction that's based in historical materials where we find Black students documenting and narrating their own experiences about how they've experienced schooling in the US in the 19th century and in the 20th century. And it's comprised of over 100 first person narratives by black students. And what we find is that black students have always been watching, right? And while the field of education is supposedly a student centered enterprise, we haven't centered student perspectives in our writing of histories of education, right? We focused on institutional histories. We focused on histories of ideology and curriculum, social reform movements in education, or individual uh, thinkers in schools and in colleges, um, but not students themselves. But as I demonstrated with the first book is that it was student perspectives that allowed me to see what black teachers did um, that offered more kind of accurate accounts of what black teachers did beyond the eyes of white surveillance. Because if I only relied on traditional sources, I would just find narratives of black teachers as compliant workers, right? Because that's the way they would show up in the public record, because they were showing and projecting one image of themselves as public employees, even as they were doing something very, very different. But so what we find is that, you know, black students have always been watching and writing and singing, right? Striving to give an account of their lived experiences as students striving in the context of schools and society. And so, Across these materials, these scattered historical documents, we find black students insisting that they have always been more than mere objects of history, but it's but instead it's subjects. So I want to share a little bit about some of these narratives that I that I pull out and that I engage with in the new book school clothes. And some of these historical artifacts include things like this poem by George Allen. Um, a young African, a 12 year old African American student at the African Free School in New York. Um, who turned in a piece of writing that was so striking that the white schoolmaster questioned its authenticity. Um, and the white schoolmaster decided that he would give a test to this young man to prove that he indeed, you know, actually wrote the, the essay that he had turned in. And so he locked him in a room for 30 minutes and required him to produce a, a piece of prose um, proving his ability. And he writes about him saying that this was a young boy, uh, a very dark boy of pure African descent, as he as he wrote about him. Um, and this is the poem that he that that he produces. But one of the things that I want to say is that as I read this poem in the text, um, as the story of this black student, he writes a poem about slavery. Um, and there's ways in which I read and you know, I close read the poem. But one of the things that becomes important is that there are all sorts of narratives in the historical record where black students are aware that their intelligence is constantly being assessed, right? This is in 1828, but we find we can go back to the story of Phyllis Wheatley in the 1700s, 
right? The ensl an enslaved girl who became the first black person and woman to publish a book of poetry in the United States, who was forced in 1772 to stand trial, but before a panel of 18 of Boston's most distinguished men, um, all of whom owned slaves, I should say, to prove that she actually wrote the poetry that was to be produced and published under her name. One thing that we know across these experiences is that this was never just about, you know, engaging in an assessment of an individual student's intelligence, but it was always about the, the assessment of an entire race, right? So these students' narratives about intelligence and the way Black students' intelligence was constantly being questioned um, appears throughout the stories. One of the other things that I read closely are these student narratives about um, the song Lift Every Voice and Sing that was written by the school principal James Weldon Johnson in the year 1900. But as Principal Johnson emphasizes, it was the school children of Jacksonville who kept singing the song and who sung the song for the first time in 1900. Um, he, he writes about this, this song spreading across the country, eventually becoming what we know today as the Black National Anthem. But he said the school children of Jacksonville kept singing the song. Some of them went to other schools and they kept singing it. Some of them became school teachers and they taught it to their pupils, right? So he's talking about, he's offering this migration narrative of black students um, going out and sharing the song, right? Which is really documenting this migration narrative of black pedagogy, where we see black students being vessels ensuring its survival across generations, right? And we see students in the early 1900s writing about lift every voice and sing down to folks like Maya Angelou and her autobiography writing about it at the tr uh, training school she attended in Arkansas, students across the country, really. But then there are also stories like the story of Ida Mae Holland, which I recover from her story as a student in Greenwood, Mississippi in the 1940s and 50s, where she documents students' awareness of white school officials shortening the black school year calendar to make sure that black students were available to pick cotton. Right, so the fact that black schools across the South often had shorter, less time in school, in part because of the demands placed on their bodies as potential field hands, as laborers. Right, Ida Mae Holland also talks about exchanging lurid stories in the bathrooms with her classmates about things they witnessed in the homes of white people while working as domestic servants as black as black female teenagers. Right, they also recount the very particular kinds of race and gendered violence that black girls experience in these homes, right? Um, an experience of vulnerability that Ida Mae Holland, as she recounts in her memoir, knew all too well. So this is one of the narratives of many narratives that we find in these black student voices where we see the tensions between racial capitalism, right? And the experiences of black education, right? These things being at odds with one another and they're coming through in students' perspectives about things that they witnessed. And then also a letter by a highly literate 10 year old Yvonne Hutchinson, my former high school English teacher. Um, this is a letter that she wrote back home to her grandmother, Mama Sissy, in 1951, after she had moved to California from Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, where she had attended the Frederick Douglass School. When she comes, this letter that she's writing to her grandmother back home uh, that she had shared with me uh, as I interviewed her. Um, she, she's one of the, she's documenting as this 10 year old girl, all the things that she's noticing about California that are distinct from her experiences as a student in Arkansas. She talks about here in California, they let, allow that, you know, uh, black people can sit wherever they want to sit on the buses, right? She also talks about, um, she says, one of the greatest things that she really emphasizes is that here in California, they let Negroes go into the library, right? Documenting the fact that in Arkansas, black students were not allowed to kind of go into the library to check out books. And this was a narrative that I didn't expect to encounter so widely in student narratives. But if any of you remember, if you were familiar with John Lewis, we know that John Lewis's first act of protest as a 16 year old student was attempting to register for a library card in Troy, Alabama, right? And this is when him and his cousins are you know, arrested by the police and, and turned around. But that's his first really civil rights um, act before he becomes a part of the civil rights movement. Um, but we find these narratives of black students awareness of being blocked out of libraries across time and space um, in these memoirs and in these recollections and oral histories that I recovered to write this book.
Um, Yvonne also talks about finding an issue of Jet Magazine and seeing Jet Magazine for the first time as this, uh, as this 11 year old girl. And she talks, she is recounting all the things that she's seeing in it to her grandmother. She says, all the people in it are colored, right? People, um, real famous people. And she talks about seeing images of Joe Lewis, right? The boxer, but also um, a number of different African-American singers that she's encountering in Jet Magazine that she's seeing and reading for the first time. So what I wanna say is that in assembling these voices of black students across the 19th and 20th century, these student narratives offer a different account of what it has meant to be a black student in the context of American schools. And they're not only documenting the stories of anti-black violence that they encountered, but they're also, in, they're also documenting the beauty they encountered, the songs they sang, right? And the freedom dreams that they manifested in schools and in their strivings, right? There's no way for us to understand people like Martin Luther King Jr., Angela Davis, John Lewis, and so many civil rights activists and writers and artists without thinking about the schools and the educational context that shaped them and formed their, their liberatory dreams, right? That they were working to enact in their work and in the civil rights movement. Um, and so this collection of black student voices, I'm hoping will be a way of kind of writing against so much work that has picked and prodded black students as specimen for study, but rarely taking seriously the things that black students have had to say in documenting their own experiences. Um, and so I feel, feel that my work as a historian is not just about using sources that are immediately available for me to write about history, but to think creatively about how to write against silences in the historical record so that we can imagine the past more expansively to also ask new questions about things that we see in the present and resources that we have in the present. Um, and I preface my talk by you know, mentioning the things that we see happening in Florida around AP African American studies and efforts to block those kinds of initiatives, right? And as someone who helped develop the AP African American studies curriculum, I see those efforts as deeply intertwined to the kinds of forces that teachers like Tessie McGee and Carter G. Woodson were up against in the early 20th century. Things have manifested and taken different forms, but there's a lot that we can learn about how these teachers and students had to navigate power in the context of American education. And I'm hoping that these materials will be a resource um, for how we act and engage and struggle around these, um, around these questions today. Thank you for listening. Uh, and hopefully there's, there's something that I shared that you might wanna invite me to talk more about uh, or to expand upon, but thank you for your attention and I appreciate it. Um, so if there are any questions or comments or reflections that folks have, and I believe that folks um, that are joining us virtually can also ask questions, but um, we have some time for some conversation and I'm excited to unpack anything that I may have said that may have been unclear, um, expound on a part that I might have covered very briefly, um, or to um, talk about something that's related to anything that I shared that I might not have mentioned at all. Thank you very much, Dr. Givens. Um, great speech, by the way, we appreciate you. Thanks. Uh, what we'll do first is we will start with some questions in the room and then we will go uh, virtually. So Dr. Rashid will go around and hand the mic to those who have questions in the room. And then after that, I will pick it up and ask questions for those that were submitted virtually. Sounds good. Kendra Duncan, University of Oregon, College of Education, Education Studies, uh, UOTeach is the program that I am a professor in. And I applaud your work. Thank you. And uh, I want to say that this is a pleasant surprise because I'm a career educator uh, from Memphis City Schools as a public schools teacher, taught every grade one through six, and then serving as a district administrator. So you've just, I did not know I was coming home when I walked <laughs> in this room. And so uh, I'm just so pleased with your work and I applaud you for the work that you are doing and carrying on our stories. And I challenge everyone in this room. I've already purchased my copy of school clothes. <laughs> I challenge you all to do the same. Thanks, I appreciate you for sharing um, that your work as an educator. Um, you know, 
talking with contemporary educators has been one of the um, it's been it's been really important for me as someone who was you know, trained as a historian and for a very long period of time, primarily in conversation with other folks doing historical research. But the kind of affirmation that I've received from contemporary educators who have shared with me how little how few opportunities they've had to actually engage in studying the history of education in general, let alone the history of black teachers, um, led to many of them feeling in some ways really cheated. The fact that some of them are trying to organize in local context to respond to things that are currently happening, having never heard the history of colored teachers associations um, across various states, sometimes in the states that they themselves are operating in. And I think that that is one of the major kind of shortcomings of teacher education is that so much of teacher education programs have really kind of placed emphasis on the procedural mandates of training people to become practitioners and really abandoned or neglected the kind of intellectual work of engaging teachers in studying the past and, and, and pedagogical traditions so that they themselves can be intentional on how they construct their professional identities in relationship with these traditions or to understand these histories and these these teach these traditions of teaching as a resource for how they understand how power works in schools, but also for thinking about how to feed their own spirit as educators and to be in relationship with these longer traditions and also think about how these black folks operating in the context of Jim Crow. Created institutions to advocate, not just for individual teachers, but for a collective vision of education that was in the interest of you know teachers and students who were very vulnerable um, and marginalized in the context of American schooling from its inception. Um, and those institutional contexts and that intellectual tradition of black teaching, I think challenges some of the ways that we've we conceptualize teachers in our society just as practitioners. Right? I, I, I write about these teachers in the book that in fugitive pedagogy and the last chapter of school clothes is about students who became teachers right so these are students who appear and are talking about their experiences in schools but then also who become teachers so like my high school english teacher that's part of the reason that i did some of the interviews with her is because i used some of the materials about her educational experiences but we also had a conversation about my experience as her student right in the last chapter of the book and there are lots of narratives like that that i bring together um but to emphasize you know, these folks as scholars of the practice and not just a practitioner vision that only focuses on doing and not thinking, right? Um, and I think that, you know, the work of a teacher is always intellectual work, not just in higher education and community colleges and universities, but educators at all levels have to be recognized as pedagogical knowers and as intellectuals. Otherwise, we are not only infringing on their dignity as educators, but when we infringe on the, on the dignity of teachers, that also is undermining the very education of the students they're supposed to be supporting. Um, and I think these teachers had a lot of clarity about that. Um, and contemporary educators, um, like you had mentioned, have just been very responsive and very supportive about why they welcome more of these kind of historical narratives and opportunities to engage in intellectual reflection on the work that they're doing. Willie Bo Matamawin, the Depi Matotai, Namin Win Kais Har Eoshla, the teachers Anama Pe, Mitewis Pasani, and Nam Puru Ben Leo Kas Poru, check it. Matumin Win, Namin Win. Thank you. You're, uh, I, I mean, I would echo what she said. Y'all have always made me feel at home. I'm a scholar of Native Studies and also of um, boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And so we've all been sitting next to each other the whole time this institutionalization has been uh, uh, put on us. Mm -hmm. When we have a, a doctor like you come in and tell us you know, about the story, not from oppression, right? Not from those places of um, less, but uh, are from more, right? And to offer your perspective, um, I can speak for myself and what I just said to you is thank you because your words are healing to me and heal my people and specifically my children. Um, I have a son who's applying to go to school where you're at right now and it's inspiring to see this type of scholarship coming from there. So um, blessings to you. My heart is happy that you're here today. <laughs>
Um, I would also, I had some questions and uh, I'm curious to know what, um, I believe I know what it is, but maybe if you could talk a little bit more about how this has happened, um, the ex exorcism mm -hmm. uh, in that, in their quote that you had there about the negative assembly. Um, and just if you could tell, like, talk about that, but also, um, I would love to hear more about the pedagogy, um, the fugitive pedagogy. I think like a lot of our pedagogies are right there, but specifically to how you're um, imagining that narrative and bringing that in. So uh, for instance, your teacher and that discussion. Um, yeah, we the both. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you for that question. Uh, the, the, this part about negative assembly from Sarah Lewis's work is essentially Sarah Lewis clarifying that um, the production of racial ideas is not only about positing monstrous representations of other of particular groups, right? It's not only the images of black people as kind of monstrous, animal-like, unintelligent. If we think about films like Birth of a Nation that really projected these um, particular kinds of images about black folks that reinforced um, anti black ideas about who black folks were about the African past right or think of like folks like Hegel appositing and asserting that Africa is beneath the kind of threshold of human history. Um, and therefore asserting that black people have no history and no culture or at least none worthy of respect right she's saying that those that positing or that those projections of racist ideas is one thing, but she's saying we also have to think about ideas that are sculpted out, right? That are not actually about projecting ideas, but about taking away ideas, right? As also a part of the construction of race and, and shaping sight and how we see um, race, right? So, you know, she's an art historian, and so she talks about sculpting. Sculpting is not only about the mold and the physical structure, but it's also about the way that you carve out an image by taking away parts of the mass of the physical object, right? So negative assembly is about um, this kind of the, the excision or the removal of ideas. Um, and in her book, what she's actually writing about is she's writing about the history of, we can think about um, the way that the kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of Caucus Mountains and the idea that white folks that you know white folks in Western civilization kind of descends from the kind of Caucus Mountains and referring to white folks as Caucasian. But she's looking at how as more and more scholarship into the 20th century started to undermine those ideas that it's not possible for that to have been the case. She talks, she looks at the quiet removal of that from atlas maps, from geography textbooks, right? Because it no longer propped up the myth of white supremacy so there's this quiet removal of that information and so she's writing about that in terms of propping up of white uh supremacist ideas when ideas no longer serve the interests of that political project but that can also be extended to the kind of excision and the removal of materials about other you know indigenous folks and black folks that kind of posit different and more expansive visions about these communities, different ways of knowing, different ways of being that disrupt the status quo and the order of things, right? So that's what that idea of negative assembly is. Whereas the work that I'm doing of assembling these, um, of archival assembly is responding to the systematic removal and neglect and exclusion of historical sources that have, um, uh, that have led to lots of silences being produced and manufactured in historical scholarship, right? Um, so that's the, the uh, response to the first part of your question. Hopefully I answered um, at least some part of it. The other th question about the fugitive pedagogy part, you know, when I was writing the book, I had no, I, I had no, I'm a his, I mean, I'm a historian, so I have no, I never try to be overly prescriptive. Like this is what it would mean today, right? Because I feel like that's kind of disciplined out of us as historians in some ways. But as when the book came out in 2021, it really, it came out at the same time that all of these anti-CRT, um, efforts and things were happening. And so it became difficult for me not to say that, you know, teachers in the contemporary moment are also having to respond similarly to power and oppression the way that Tessie McGee had to in 1933, but also folks like Carter G. Woodson as well. Um, and so I'm open to the fact that what I'm, even what, I, what I'm writing about is a, is a particular 
narrative of African-American history and African-American education, right? Because it's building on this trope from the fugitive slaves and enslaved folks who pursued learning through subversive means, right? Because black education was criminalized at a time when indigenous education was forced upon them, right? This is, this is one of the things that's slightly different when it comes to indigenous education and black education that I'm actually writing about in the book that I'm finishing now, that's it's called American Grammar, and it's looking at the relationship between native, white, and black education through the 19th century. So while you have the US government forcing education on indigenous communities, because that's a part of disappearing indigenous ways of being and, their, and disrupting their relationship to land, right? That's the political economic motivation. So schooling is imposed upon them because it's a part of disappearing indigenous ways of life and also um, tribal identities, right? That has to do with indigenous people being in relationship with land in different ways um, based on the kind of America's desire for westward expansion. When it comes to black folks, Black folks are the only group of people for whom literacy and education was literally criminalized, right? Illegal before the United States is even established. And this is in part because while you have an investment in a shrinking indigenous population and forcing the disappearance of indigenous folks, there's an investment in the expansion of black folks as chattel slavery. And when we think about the use of slave labor for the production and the expansion of the, of the state, of, of the US economy, and westward expansion, right? Slave labor is being used to kind of work and exploit and extract resources from the ground that's being um, uns that's that's being kind of essentially dis that native folks are being dispossessed of. And schooling and education policies maps on to those different racial projects in very distinct ways, both very violent and distinct and a part of racial domination, but distinct in kind, right? Um, and I guess what I'm saying is that this history of fugitive pedagogy that I'm writing about is one that the language that I'm using is deeply related to the experience of black folks in the US, but it's really a universal story about how subjugated groups respond to power through education, right? And how when your education and your pursuit of education is against the dominant order, you have to, you have to find ways of navigating power. Um, and, and indigenous folks also did this, but outside of boarding schools oftentimes, and also sometimes in boarding schools and using resources that they could towards um, different ends, not the ends that were intended by white missionaries or state actors imposing education on indigenous folks, right? So I guess what I'm saying is that what I'm calling fugitive pedagogy is a story of, it's, it's a human story that I'm writing about in a particular way based in African-American history, but it applies to folks in South Africa during apartheid who are choosing to kind of develop a kind of an anti-apartheid pedagogy and curriculum and teaching against the grain, whether that be the, the languages that they're choosing to offer instruction in, right, as opposed to Afrikaans, but choosing either English as a refusal of the kind of dominant oppressive system there. It's a story about how folks are navigating power and also how, pow how education has always been used and weaponized in particular ways, right? It's been used towards liberatory ends, but we know very well in terms of black and indigenous folks that it's also been used toward nefarious ends, right? But at the same time, that story of oppression is not the only story because when we tell the story from below, black folks like indigenous folks, like other oppressed groups all over the world have recognized how they're being oppressed and have developed strategies to navigate those strictures and those kind of um, constraints. Um, and so I would say that fugitive pedagogy maps onto things that teachers are doing today in terms of trying to figure out strategies to work outside of the kind of anti CRT bills, right? Or trying to figure out ways of in introducing African American studies to their students, even as it's being um, banned and targeted by um, state officials, right? So those are some of the ways that I see the relationship happening. But what I'm hoping is that teachers will recognize that what they're doing in the current moment is not unrelated from a much longer struggle around liberatory education, right? And that's one of the things that I'm hoping the book will offer them is this kind of affirmation that it's important for teachers to be, have a political clarity that education is always political, right? And that when you are not aware of how the structures of education are being used, um, you know, how they may or may not be in alignment with your vision of what you're doing or the best interests of your students, right? I'm hoping that this history can clarify some of that and can be a resource as teachers are studying 
um, to do good work in the contemporary times. Thank you very much, Dr. Givens. Um, we have uh, three questions in the chat so far. Okay. And hopefully we can get to all three. Um, if we do not manage to get to all three, please note that your questions have been received and we will try to set up some follow-up. Um, also, um, thank you, Ben Thorpe. She also accepted the challenge and bought your book. <laughs> okay, so, thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, first question will go to Jen Jameson. Thank you for educating us on the topic, Dr. Givens. Have you found comprehensive process archives on African-American history and education anywhere in your research? If so, where? Comprehensive archives on the history, on African, the history of African-American education? Yeah, I can repeat the question. Mm -hmm. Have you found comprehensive processed archives on African-American history and education anywhere in your research? If so, where? Yeah, um, so I would say, no, there are very few, uh, this the Black Teacher Archive, it'll be a digital uh, uh, portal that it won't be behind a paywall, so it'll be open access, so anyone um, will be able to have access to it, but it will effectively be the largest um, uh, digital collection, and, and likely I would also say the largest um, collection in general on African American teaching and education. Um, so there are places where there are pretty good uh, and I should also say HBCUs. So some of the history of individual HBCUs have pretty comprehensive archives of their own institutions. But in terms of black education more broadly, there's not a single place that one can kind of go to currently as a place for someone who's trying to engage in deep historical study about this particular topic, the way that you might be able to go to certain places um, around uh, the study of, of individual organizations or of, you know, or of a kind of you know, uh, a collection on, you know, uh, black lawyers in the kind of United States. And there might be a place where you can go for like a lot of materials and stuff preserved specifically for that topic. Um, and in part, because I feel like the history of education is underappreciated in the field of history and African, the history of African-American education has been under underappreciated in the field of African-American studies as well beyond like Brown v. Board of Education we haven't fully appreciated the way that the work black teachers did historically is really the only way that we actually get the establishment of black studies. And also, I would also say ethnic studies in American colleges and universities in the 1960s, because we haven't fully accounted for, you know, this intellectual world that black school teachers, not higher education, you know, professionals were doing because many, you know, Carter G. Woodson had a PhD, but was still a high school teacher because at this time period, period, even when they had advanced degrees, they were barred from other professional opportunities. So many of them actually were school teachers. Um, and so I would say that a lot of that history has not been well preserved. I would also say that it probably hasn't been well preserved even at HBCUs, because even at, I still go to these places to recover the material, but many HBCUs were not um, allowed, not I shouldn't say allowed, but were not um, provided resources to have archivists until many of them until the 1980s, right? Um, these organizations that I'm talking about were forced to dismantle themselves in the 1960s, right? So you can imagine the, that gap in time, the amount of resources that would have been lost um, and kind of, you know, either an individual person held on to them, maybe there was a professor at a certain school that held on to these collections and they were later included in an archive. But the way that I've found these materials, they've been, it's been a, a kind of a mixed bag. Um, there's this one story, for instance, from the state of Georgia, there's a book called The Lost Education of Horace Tate, where Vanessa Siddle Walker, who's a very important scholar of the history of African American education, really someone who inspired a lot of my work. Um, but she uh, talks about she did a lot of interviews with the last living executive director of the Georgia Educator and Teachers Association, which was the Georgia version of these color teachers associations that I'm talking about. Um, and essentially, he had just held on to hundreds of boxes from, and he had bought the old building that the, the teacher organization used to use as its office when it was forced to merge with the former all white organization that had previously excluded black teachers and who were also the organization that were trying to uphold segregation as they were being forced to merge. Um, but he essentially bought the building and just kept all of the materials there. And she, you know, 
in building a relationship with him, got access to those materials, which was a near complete collection of the Georgia teachers and educators files. And one of the reasons I'm saying that this is important is because it's only because she discovered those materials that she was able to then trace this really intimate connection between the Black Teachers Associations and the NAACP. So many people think about lawyers as being the kind of major political actors in winning Brown v. Board of Education. But what we what's revealed through these teacher organizations records is that, you know, at a time when the NAACP couldn't had struggles growing its membership in southern states because the black folks were targeted like Septima Clark and fired for being an NAACP member. You had very few black folks who could openly be a part of the organization, even if they supported the cause. But what black folks did, particularly the teachers, the largest professional group was they funneled money to the NAACP through these teacher associations when they individually couldn't give money, right? So the litigation campaigns that the NAACP waged were in large part funded by money offered to them by these black teacher organizations and also a lot of the data that was collected to build the case on the road to Brown was co data collected by black school teachers who had access to parents and communities to actually gather the information that was used to effectively argue the case in Brown v. Board of Education. Um, that was a somewhat comprehensive archive about the Georgia teachers that was discovered in a kind of a personal collection of one of these former activists who were in the, who was in the organization, not because it was preserved at any particular place. Right. Um, there are some exceptions, but I would say that that's a way of getting in, and I'm going to be quiet because I know you have two more questions. Uh, but but yeah, so hopefully that answers what you're saying. No co full comprehensive thing, but it always kind of requires this piecing and also thinking outside of traditional historical um, repositories and stuff like that in order to get the material that's necessary to tell more complete histories. Thank you very much. Okay, from Priyanka. Thank you so much for your presentation. I am deeply inspired by not only your scholarship, but the care and dignity you have given to archives. I imagine many primary sources are tucked away in closets, as you mentioned. What sorts of outreach and advocacy will the archive do to find other sources that may be forgotten? Mm, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, so we're currently completing phase one of this archive, but we're also, I imagine, and it's already happened thus far that a number of people have reached out um, to share that they have personal materials that will be relevant for this collection. Um, some people who come from families of teachers in places like South Carolina, or even places in, you know, you know in Boston, like there's a um, woman that I met um, recently uh, whose aunt who helped raise her was a very important teacher at a school called the Palmer Institute in North Carolina, which was a very important black independent school um, founded by a woman named Charlotte Hawkins Brown, who was a close friend of people like Mary McLeod Bethune, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the materials that she has from her aunt, um, lesson plans from her time teaching there, her school books as a student as a, at the Palmer Institute that she just has in her personal collections that haven't been placed anywhere. And so one of the things that we're doing is gonna help facilitate um, relationships between some of these people who have personal collections and places where they can be collected physically, but then also um, identifying certain elements of those collections that might be a useful thing to kind of, uh, for digit, as a digital resource that might be included in the Black Teacher Archive collection. Um, but there are other things that I've also become really interested in. So this is also one of the things that I really become interested in is all of this footage that potentially exists about black school life. Um, this is like footage from the, you know, the early 1950s of a teacher recording just things from the schoolyard, um, you know, school activities. This was found at an estate sale that there's an African American woman who was working with the National Museum of African American History, but she started this African American home video um, archive where she just kind of collects these things. It's not just about school, but for me as a historian, there are things that you're able to see and imagine and then reflect on in the historical writing that you can't see in kind of physical sources, but that photographs and video footage might become a resource for. Right. So these are the sorts of things that, you know, I've been trying to think about how what it might it mean to branch out to, to the next phases of this archival project that I'm doing um, to think about 
one, both kind of the discovery, but also the preservation of these materials so that they're not lost and so that they can be available, not just for my research, but think about folks who, are, who don't have down the, line, down the line, who won't have the relationship with folks like my former high school teacher that I talked about and folks that are currently around of a particular generation for oral histories, but, that, but how these materials might open up new ways of studying the past um, that, that we can preserve and make possible um, if, if we do this work now. So these are a sort of you know, part of the range of things that I'm thinking about. Um, but there are lots of things that are out there. I'm sure many things that I haven't thought of, but that's an excellent question and something that I'm constantly um, trying to figure out how to build into the work that we're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, last question um, from Sarah. Thank you so much for being here. I have many questions, but I'm going to ask one rooted more <laughs> in the heart than the brain. I wondered if you might share with us a story, discovery, or idea you encountered when engaging in the research that led you to write school clothes that shaped how you understood the emotional experiences of these student witnesses? What a deep question. I want to know who. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. from Sarah Lucia. She is also one of our faculty members. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. excellent question. I really appreciate that. So the title, uh, this is an opportunity for me to tell you a little bit about the title, because the book is not about clothing, right? It's, it, I mean, metaphorically, it is if we think about me um, offering these stories of Black student witnessing as a kind of cultural armor that might be a resource for contemporary Black students and folks wor working um, with Black students in the contemporary moment, right? Um, as a kind of covering um, and a, with a kind of a cultural heritage and political heritage that I think um, very few students or in the contemporary moment have access to. But I was when I was doing research for my first book, I was at the archives at Fisk and I was looking for um, some of those documents connecting Carter G. Woodson to these black teacher associations. But then I came across this interview from a sociologist that worked at Fisk named Charles Johnson, a very important black sociologist interviewing Mary McLeod Bethune, who's the a very prominent black educator and political leader from the early 20th century. But she's writing, she's the child of formerly enslaved people in South Carolina, but she's talking about um, her when she's being sent off to go to school in North Carolina at the age of, she's either she's between 13 and 16 at the time, but she had, went as far as she could at in the one room schoolhouse at the Presbyterian Church in Maysville, South Carolina. But she talks about this community of black sharecroppers um, stopping work on the day that she's being sent off to go be put on a train to go to school. And this is in the 1880s, um, this is in the 1880s. And she talks about so many of these kind of poor and impoverished sharecroppers making clothes and gifting her with clothes to send her off to go to school. Um, and it was just a really beautiful story that Mary McLeod Bethune described about this communal investment in her as an individual person, but really not just an investment in her as a person, but an investment in a promise and an idea about what black education could be and trying to project a kind of a different vision of their collective future, right? And pushing um, this, this young leader to kind of go on and pursue her education. But that story by Mary McLeod Bethune made me recall so many other different stories about by black students in the reconstruction era and right after talking about dressing up to go to school for the first time, right? You have formerly enslaved students writing about um, their parents working to kind of stitch together clothing to present them, uh, for them to go to school. And essentially it's them asserting a new image of themselves that's really challenging and disrupting so social images that are always projected on them both during the period of enslavement and even after, but trying to carve a new vision and form of self-representation for themselves. Um, and those stories about these black students right after the period of enslavement um, and the idea of self fashioning became very important for me thinking about not just the physical material clothing themselves, but also how these folks were going to school and also trying to engage in a, in a, in a way at a time to assert a new image of what their lives as free people could look like and what it could mean. Um, and all of those things I see being negotiated um, through these stories of school clothes in the early 20th century, right? I, I, you can find letters of, there's this a formerly enslaved boy who's going to Hampton Institute um, in 1866, actually, and he writes to the administrators at Hampton saying, you know, he only makes $5.50 a week, but, he, but that they can rely on him com coming soon as he gets his affairs in order, and, and as soon as he gets him a suit, 
they can look for him in the wind is what he says, right? Um, and I just found those stories to be so beautiful and it add, added a very important kind of texture to the story that I wanted to um, bring onto the page uh, because I, I also have fond memories of kind of like going and shopping for school clothes that I think is something that the kind of phrase I think carries a lot of resonance with a lot of communities, but I think particularly with African-American communities. Um, but then there are also all of these stories of those first black students to desegregate schools. And they talk about how they were really, a lot of emphasis was placed on how they represented themselves. And we think of the images of Ruby Bridges or the Little Rock Nine desegregating schools. They're all very neatly put together because in many ways they understand the representational politics that are happening in that important political moment, right? It's not about just these shallow ideas about you know, um, materialistic ideas about clothing, but it's also about asserting a sense of dignity and a self and a self a sense of self worth in a world that has that's hostile to your very existence. That we see these students kind of expressing through those stories. Um, but that's the one. It really began with that story from Mary McLeod with Doom. But those are some other pieces of it that came together. But thank you for that question. I'm going to turn it over to this brother here, who's going to um, close us out. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Givens. I, I, I think we all in thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I will say that the information provided here today is as sharp as the brother is well dressed. So thank you very much for everyone attending physically and online and um, have a great day. <laughs>